Well, praise the Lord, saints. It's good to see you all tonight. Thank you. It's good to be here. Thank God for his word. Thank God for his mercy. Thank God for the blood of Jesus, the name of Jesus, and his holy, holy, holy written word. Woo. This is our constitution to the covenant. The Bible is your constitution. It tells you your constitutional rights. And the, the Bible says in Hebrews that no man can change this, con this constitution. The Bible says that anywhere there is a testament, which is the word covenant, which means agreement, it says it only goes into force once the testator, which is the one that makes the testament, once the testator dies, his testament goes into force. That would tell us that the New Testament, which was sealed by Jesus' blood, went into force when Jesus said it is finished. Always remember, these things did not go into force when you found out about them or when you received them. That's just when you received them. They went into force when Jesus died. Isn't that good? Um, I thank you all for being here tonight. Heath Haley and JC and Molly Joe, thank you all for serving all of us tonight, the food. It was so fun, so good. If you would like to serve the family uh, on a Wednesday night, once, say, every five or six weeks, uh, it's a, it is a ministry for sure, and it's, and it's done as unto the Lord. You can let Miss Barbara know, and she'll put you on the church calendar. Uh, it's real simple foods. We've gone to real simple things, you know, but, but it's a good thing. It's a good thing. Anytime we do good for others, the Bible says that our reward comes from God. It's interesting that when he said that in Ephesians 5, 8, I think, when he said, um, whatsoever good thing a man does, the same shall he receive from the Lord, that context there is doing for others. It's very interesting he didn't say when you do something good for you, the Lord will reward you. He said when you do something good for others, God is your reward. That's a great thought. And uh, I want us to look at some things tonight. We're going to trust the Holy Ghost to sew all this together. My heart's just so full. Um, but the Holy Spirit said, Jesus said in red, he said, when you come together, he said, the anointing of God will give you words to say. Now, I didn't say I'm empty. I didn't say I'm lost. I said my heart's full. Okay. Okay. And so we're going to trust the Lord to make my tongue like the pen of a ready writer. And I'm going to trust that you have an ear to hear and that you want to learn. And I know you do or you wouldn't be here. We've gathered together in the name of Jesus. We've gathered together in one spirit, one body, one assembly, one accord. We're all in the same chord and that's always good. <laughs> You're a musician, that's always good to be in the same chord. <laughs> We're all in the one accord. We're here by assignment. We're here by appointment. None of us are, are, are just, you know, here because perchance. We're here on purpose. We've gathered together on purpose and we've gathered in the name of Jesus. And we've gathered in his spirit. We've gathered in his love, his joy, his peace. We've gathered in that name. So Father, we trust you tonight to lead us and guide us, show us things to come, teach us all things and lead us into truth. Father, we ask that you'd open the eyes of our understanding. 
that we might know what belongs to us and learn who our true identity in Christ Jesus is. That we might be confident that we are the sons of God. We trust you. We trust the written word. We trust the rhema of God. We trust the Holy Spirit. We look to the Holy Spirit now for he is our comforter. He is our source. He is the voice of God. He's the friend of the bridegroom. And Holy Spirit, we welcome you, your presence, your gifts, your manifestations. I thank you then in the, in the presence of the Lord, there is fullness of joy. We thank you tonight, Lord. We thank you for joy. We thank you for joy that he hath made me glad. He hath made me glad. I will rejoice for he hath made me glad. I thank you, Lord, that you have turned our mourning into dancing. I thank you, Lord, that the spirit of grief has been bound and rebuked and, and it has not dominion over us. For we don't grieve the way the world grieves. We don't sorrow the way the world sorrows. Father, we pray that every person that's tuned in tonight by, by internet would have an ear to hear and that we all would just take on a teachable spirit and by faith just, just, just bring our soul into obedience to the spirit and the word and that we will leave not the same in Jesus' name. We worship you now. We're not in any hurry. We just worship you, Jesus. We worship Jesus. Bless the Lord. Thank you, Lord Jesus. We worship you. We praise you. We thank you that as the word goes forth, that faith is going to come up in our hearts. And I thank you tonight. I thank you, Lord, that no weapon formed against us shall be able to prosper. And every tongue that rises up against us to judge us, you said in your word that that tongue, that word, that curse would be brought to naught. And so our confidence is in you. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Well, turn with me if you would to Ephesians chapter 6. I mean, that already, it's already good. Just saying that, that, that portion of Scripture is good. If you know anything about the Bible, as soon as somebody says Ephesians, you go, ooh. And then when they say six, you go, ooh. <laughs> like on Lion King, ooh, say it again, ooh. Say it again, ooh. Ooh, Mufasa. That was the lion's name. Now, that wasn't tongues. That was the lion's name. <laughs> I said, Mufasa. Ooh, he talked in the Holy Ghost. <laughs> Mufasa. <laughs> Ephesians 6. Now, this is something that we must absolutely know. Hopefully, tonight we'll do some teaching and some, some explaining. We need preaching and we need teaching. And so we need explanation. But these are some things I want to talk to tonight. I think I want to call it media department, I wouldn't print this on the CDs just yet, but I think we want to call it How to Endure Persecution and Affliction. And I think it's something that we all need to see from the Bible. I'm talking about the victorious way to do it, the kingdom way. I'm talking about the, how did Jesus, how did Paul how did Timothy, Silas, Titus, Luke, John, how did they endure persecution and affliction? What is persecution and affliction? Well, the Bible will tell us. How did they endure persecution and affliction the right way? There's a right way. There's a, there's a way that you come out stronger. Isn't that good? I don't want to be spiritually like many people that go to gyms are this way. 
And I don't believe, no, it can't be because they want to be. Nobody would want this result. Many people, many have a gym membership and they work out religiously. But look, listen to me, they don't ever get any stronger. Am I right, D? They work out, been working out for years. But listen to me, they may get a little bit ripped. They may get a little bit cut up. They may, and it takes time to even look like, yeah, he works out. It takes time. It's a serious commitment. Now listen, but they never get any, any stronger. And I'll tell you why. You have to lift for strength and you have to lift for bulk. You have to lift to rip up. It's whatever your goal is. But who in their right mind would want to go to the gym year after year after year and never see any strength results? And we don't, these are things I want to talk some, these are going to be kind of some, some deeper issues. But these things, when we do it the right way, we come out not the same. And we come out stronger. The Bible says in Proverbs that a man that can control his spirit is better than the mighty. And he that can control his tongue and his spirit is greater than a man that can whoop the entire city. Now that's God's definition of a strong man contest. That's God's definition of that's a strong man. Man not just being gender, but human-faced, humans. Now, always remember this, the natural man cannot do that. The Bible says in James 3, the natural man cannot tame, T-A-M-E, tame the tongue. Also remember this, the natural man cannot control his imaginations. Those things are both done only by knowing some, some truth and believing by faith and it all is always going to go back to loving God. That alone is uh that's the strength to do. <laughs> if I don't love God, eventually me forgiving you and forgiving you and forgiving you and for, will catch up with me. <laughs> and eventually I'm sick of forgiving you and I'm sick of what you're doing. And I'm going to go to the natural every time, eventually. And then I'm going to end up defaulting and handling confrontation the only way I know to handle confrontation. And all of us have a default. You may eat, you may spend. You may holler, you may scream, you may peel out and go to the, you may, you may go to the internet. You may, you see what, we all got a default until that default becomes, I love God. And the reason I do this is because I know that's what he's done for me over and over and over. That's what gives me the power to sustain in walking in love and walking in faith. Otherwise, it, it, listen, it's not by your might, power, or strength. Are you with me? See, religion is I do it and do it so that God will. Christianity is not a religion. Christianity is a life. And I do it because he has. Religion is trying to teach, do it so he will. Listen, while I was dead in sin, Christ died for me. That's what your Bible says. The Bible says, while we were sinners, Christ died for us. The unjust was bought and paid for by the just, First Peter. And so, 
As we begin to learn our true identity, remember these things go back to the first and greatest commandment of all from the beginning until the end was love God with all your heart. That's huge. All your soul. Now there's the feeling side of man. That's huge. All your mind. Your mind. And all your strength. Love God. I can tell you this. When the Bible says resist the devil and he'll flee from you, we got to keep it in context because he said this, submit yourself to God, comma, resist the devil and he'll flee from you. I can assure you that submitting to God is the empowerment to resist the devil. If I'm not submitted to God, his way, the kingdom way, I'm not submitted to his word. If I'm not submitted to his love, if I'm not submitted to his word, his spirit, I am not empowered to resist the devil. Matter of fact, I don't even know it's the devil. I think it's me. You hear? And so let's look at this. Let's, let's, let's call this the biblical way to endure persecution and affliction. Ephesians 6, 10. Finally, my brethren, I'm just glad he calls us brethren. The Bible says he's not ashamed to call you brethren. Aren't you glad he's not ashamed to call you brethren? That means that I don't need to be ashamed to call you brother. Or sister. I think we need, I feel something here. We need to, we need to stop, stop right here just for a second. Don't you run your brother or your sister down. And I'm saying this as nice as I know how. If I hear you dogging and devouring and eating the sheep, I'm going to come to you in love. And if I need to bring another brother with me or two brothers with me, Listen, I'm not being funny. Jesus said do that. He said, if you won't hear me, bring a brother with me. It's not because I'm scared you're going to jump out of your skin or something. I'm, it's, it's to have another witness there. Amen. You watch what you run your tongue when it comes to the brethren. Because before you open your mouth and go dogging them, you better remember that you're born of the same spiritual womb they are. And if you want to get on the fighting side of God, I'm telling you, that's Bible. You want to get on the fighting side of God, you go dogging his children. I'm telling you, that'll get you cut off from the mercy of God in a heartbeat, brother. That's straight talk, but you know, we don't have a lot of time. And it's a high time for straight talk. I'm not saying it's going on. I'm saying we just, listen, that devil don't have place in this house. This is a house of love. It's a house of peace. It's a house of mercy. It's a house of acceptance. I look over communication card, over communication card, over communication card. Listen to me. I've never once seen one communication card yet where on your little communication card says, were you greeted warmly when you entered the church? I've never seen the box no check. Well, if I'm not mistaken, my Bible says this is how they'll know you are. True disciples is by your love. Thank God for tongues, but he didn't say by your tongues. He didn't say by all the miracles. Thank God for miracles. I'm gonna tell you the greatest miracle though is learning how to walk in the love of God. That's the highest, that's the highest, that is the highest walk of faith you can perform, saints. That's huge. Jesus said in John 14, 10, he said, the words that I speak, say words. Words. The words that I speak are not my own. And it is my father that doeth the works. Say works. works. Okay. The words that I speak, I only speak what he tells me to speak. And he does the works. Next verse. And greater works than I do shall you do. Okay, hang on. We got, let, there's, this is worth looking at. 
The words I speak, I only speak the words he tells me to say, words. And he does the works and greater works than I do, you shall do. Okay, words, works. What is the work that Jesus did was this. Only releasing out of my mouth what the Spirit of God gives me to say. And that is what authorized his words and that's why God performed the works. When Jesus would say something, God would perform it. I'm telling you, the great, one of the greatest works you can perform is learning how to control the tongue. Because you can't do that without loving God. That's a great work. That's big. And I tell you, it, 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 it puts a premium value on love God. I love God. I love God. I want to please God more than I want to please the natural side of me. Are you with me? Ephesians 6, 10, my brethren, be strong in the Lord. That's good. And in the power of his might, put on the whole armor of God. So there's armor. Well, you know, if, we, if it tells us we're going to have armor, that must mean we're going to need armor. That must mean we're in a fight of some kind. <laughs> if there's armor. Put on the, all of it, ever peace. What if, what if you went to a football game, say you went to see a football game, all the players ran out there and you saw this couple of them run out there and they had, they had their pants on, they had their thigh pads, rump pads, they got their hip pads, they got this pad, that pad, and they got their jersey and they got their pads and they didn't have a helmet. What would you, what you would go, Oh. Well, yeah, it's the same thought when, if, if, when, when, when we don't put on all the armor. Put on all the, the whole armor, the whole armor. This is why, so that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, powers, rulers of darkness of this, this world and spiritual wickedness in the heavenlies. Verse 11 again, put on the whole armor of God so that you may be empowered to stand against the wiles of the devil. The word wiles in the Greek is, is the Greek word that translates travesty. It means the highways. His, it means comma, methods of traveling. It's, it's, it's the ruts through your soul where he, the, I'm talking about the, the roads, he always travels. It's, it's, it's the, the, the highways, the highways, the, the methods of traveling. Put on the armor of God so that you may stand against that. Because we don't wrestle against flesh and blood. That in itself right there, saints, is something you must remember. My battle is not with flesh and blood. It's spiritual. And if you're not very careful, you will bring the fight into this realm are you with me here? You'll bring it down on this level. And you don't want to be in that arena because that's, there's no anointing there. Your authority is first of all spiritual. You see? You don't, you don't want to let the devil lure you down on this level. Now you're on his playing field. Now you're in his arena. You want to stay in the spirit, in the word, in the kingdom way where he's stripped and defeated. 
and where you've been raised up far above all principality, power, might, dominion, every name that is named in heaven, earth, and under the earth. All right, so we've got to know that. Put on the armor of God so that you may be empowered to stand against, we could say this, the voices of the enemy. Always remember, I've said it many times, we'll say it again, every voice has a plan. And you always want to seek first the kingdom plan. What did God say do? Because we're not wrestling against flesh and blood. Okay. Now, I want you to look with me at 2 Corinthians 12. Turn back to the left just a little bit here. 2 Corinthians 12. Let's look at this. We're going to say a few things about the biblical way to endure persecution and affliction. Second Corinthians 12 and verse 7, please. Thank you, Jesus. And lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was appointed to me a thorn in the flesh, comma, the messenger of Satan. This is what his appointment is, to buffet me. Lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing, I sought the Lord three times and I asked God that it might, that thorn, that messenger that was appointed by Satan to buffet Paul because of the revelation and the word coming to him and his ministering it, ministering it and teaching and preaching it. He said, I sought the Lord three times to that it might leave from me. And this was the response. Paul, my grace is sufficient. Paul, my grace is sufficient. Paul, my grace is sufficient. All three times. That's the word of the Lord that he got back. And the third time Paul got it. He said, most gladly, Verse nine, he said, my grace is sufficient for my strength. My strength, Paul, is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my, my infirmities, my, my weakness of my human side, so that the power of Christ, not Jesus, Christ, the power of the anointing may rest upon me. Okay, we're building now, we're, we're building. Verse seven again. There was appointed to me a thorn in the flesh. This is the thorn. The messenger of Satan to buffet me. The Greek word buffet is, it means it's a boat that is going out through the water like this and it's the waves that are hitting the front of the boat. That's what the Greek word buffet means. Now, that messenger sent from Satan, that was his assignment. That's what his, his job description was. You buffet him, you stir people up everywhere he goes, you, you bring persecution. I mean, you do anything you can do to stop that man and get him to draw back out of faith and get him to close his mouth and stop preaching this revelation. That, that was that principality and that power's job. Was to, was to buffet Paul every day, everywhere he went. And Paul sought the Lord. Lord, take this thing from me. Paul, my grace is enough. Lord, take this thing from me. Paul, my grace is enough. Lord, take this thing from me. Paul, my grace is enough. This is huge. Paul had the revelation already. We've been raised up to be seated with him in the heavenly places, far above all principality, power, might, dominion. 
Paul had the revelation of Colossians 1. He has made me fit and he's made me an heir of God, a joint heir with Jesus Christ, Romans 8, 17. He had the revelation. I've been lifted up out of darkness. I've been placed into the kingdom of his dear son. I've been given authority in Christ over all demons, over all. There comes a time that God expects you to use the revelation that you have. Because listen, Paul was the one that had authority to rebuke that spirit. And that's why God kept telling him, my grace is enough, Paul. My grace is enough. Now see, this is what religion will do. Your grace is sufficient, and, but, and, but they just ride out the storm. You don't ride out the storm. You rebuke the storm. Are you listening to me? You, 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 you put on something. You put on the armor of God so that you, not God. God's not having any challenges with the devil, I can assure you. Jesus is not having, there's no arguments between Jesus and the devil. It's not a debate. The Holy Ghost has no issues with the devil. And the more we learn who we are in Christ and what that covenant of blood has done for us and made us to be, it, it empowers us to walk in more and more victory, more and more liberty that is already ours. Okay? So, the messenger of Satan is what the thorn was. The Greek word thorn is the, is the Greek word that translates care, where he said in Mark 4, the cares of this life choke out the word. That's the same Greek word. There was, a, there was given to me, appointed to me, a thorn, a care. And he tells us what that was, the messenger of Satan. He tells us what his job was, to buffet him. Now let's look at how that that demon spirit. I'm going to talk here for a little bit about demons and the, and the demonical persecution. I'm not talk, now listen, I'm not talking about going through a hard day. I'm, that's, no, that's on a one, on a one to 10, that's like half of a one. I'm talking about demonic attack on somebody. I'm talking about something that, that will drown you if you don't know how to endure it the right way. You will, it will, it will eventually, it will mute your voice. It will rob your gifting. It will put your gifting that God has ordained in you, it will put it into dormancy. I want us to talk a little bit here in a minute about the spirit of fear, the spirit of intimidation, and the spirit of Jezebel. And, and, and just say a few things. Just give us some empowerment here. Knowledge is, is weaponry. You understand that? So that's, that's what we want to look at. Now, now let's see how that thing buffeted him. Let's, let's go to 2 Timothy chapter 3, please. Turn to the right. 2 Timothy 3. This is something that all of us need to be savvy of because every one of us go through times when we've got to know something about these tools. Otherwise, we grow weary in well-doing and we will faint in our mind. Yes. 2 Timothy 3, verse 10, please. We'll read 10, 11, 12. He's talking to Timothy, his son in the faith, but you, Timothy, have fully known my doctrine. You have known my manner of life. You've known my purpose. You've known my faith. You've known my long suffering. You've known my love walk. You've known my patience. You've also known my persecutions and afflictions which came unto me at Antioch, at Iconium, and at Lystra, those persecutions 
I endured, but out of them all, the Lord delivered me. Now, this is what I want to say, first of all, that most people never bring up. Listen, no more thorn. People, people act like Paul had that thorn from then till he went to be with Jesus. No, he said, the Lord delivered me out of them all. No more thorn. He, he understood God's grace is enough and he, and he did what he needed to do and he got rid of the thorn. All right, now, let's read it again, verse 11. Persecutions and afflictions which came unto me at Antioch. Stop right there. Let's look at what happened at Antioch. Hold your place there, if you will, and go to Acts 13, 44, please. This is Antioch where he's talking about there in 2 Timothy. Acts 13, 44. Let's look at what he means when he says persecutions and afflictions. And he also calls that buffeting by a messenger of Satan. This is good, isn't it? Huh? This makes us wear. He calls it a buffeting. He calls it by a, a, a demonic, a demon spirit that was sent to stir this up and he calls it persecution and affliction. That's the two things he called it. 1344. And the next Sabbath day came almost the whole city together to hear the word of God. Wow. And when the Jews, now in, in the book of Acts, when you read Jews, it's not talking about the Jewish people. It's talking about the Jewish religious leaders, mostly Pharisees and Sadducees, okay? So don't get a, take a bad attitude toward the Jews. This is their religious leaders. Watch this. Almost the whole city came out to hear the word. But when the Jewish leaders saw the multitudes that were coming to hear Paul and Barnabas, watch this. When they saw it, they were filled with envy and spoke. Watch this. Do you see that? Let's read it slow. You can't just read the Bible. You got to read it. They saw it. They were filled with envy and spoke against those things which were spoken, taught, and preached by Paul contradicting and blaspheming. All right. Read it again. We're not in a hurry. Read this again. But when the leaders saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spoke. What your heart is full of comes out of your mouth. Let me say something real quick. Being filled with the Spirit is so much more than just the baptism of the Holy Ghost. All through the book of Acts, chapter 2, they were filled. Chapter 4, they were filled. Other places, they were filled. But many times it says this, and P this is after the initial filling. It says, and Peter, filled with the Spirit, said, men and brethren, hearken unto me. In other words, the anointing of God came on him and gave him something to say. That's being filled with the Spirit. Paul, the Bible says that a person that was trying to, the, there was a deputy in the town that was really hungry for God and Paul was teaching him and there was another person in the town that was, ah, you don't need to listen to that. Ah, that guy, yeah, yeah, yeah. He was, that's demons. That's demonic influence. And this guy was being used by it. And the Bible says, Paul filled with the spirit pointed at him and says, you shall be blind for a season because you're coming against and, and explains it. And the Bible says immediately that man was blind. But listen to me, he said that. That wasn't just Paul saying it. He was filled with the Spirit and said it. There was anointing. Is this making sense? Filled with the Spirit to saying. Other places it says, Paul filled with the Spirit said. Peter filled with the Spirit said. That's good. Watch this. They were filled with envy and said. That's why I said that about this word filled. They were filled with envy and spoke against the things, the truths that Paul was preaching. And they were contradicting it and they were blaspheming it. Listen to me. 
It's one thing uh, to talk about the word, to, to debate a little, study. It's another thing to have a spirit that just contradicts. It's a spiritual thing. It contradicts. It just contradicts. It's, it's, it's just going to contradict it. Contradict it, contradict, contradict, stand back, come back, come back, come back, unteachable, unbendable, stiff-necked, hard-hearted, all those words. Blaspheming, 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 blaspheming. You see what I'm saying? All right. So that there, there's, that's what he was talking about over here in 2 Timothy when he says, you know the persecutions and afflictions that came to me at Antioch. That's where he, that was this setting. They were moved with envy and they, they, they spoke against the things that, that Paul was preaching and teaching. That's persecution and that's affliction. They were contradicting it and they were blaspheming. Look at verse 46. Then Paul and Barnabas waxed bold. That means they grew bold. Listen, the, boldness is not, a, is not an act of the flesh. It, boldness is nothing of the flesh. True boldness is something that comes on you from the Holy Ghost. And boldness is not a delivery. Boldness doesn't mean that he lifted his voice. I'll tell you what, I've seen Pastor Ken say some things about this quiet. And it was bold. And it shook the room when it was said. Listen to me. If you're always threatening, it's going to be hard for you to threat. You with me? If everything is a 10 with you, then when it really is a 10, nobody's really going to believe you because you're always 911. This is good, isn't it? Are we all doing all right, everybody? You cry wolf. This is good. We're told, we're told, we're told to the Gentiles. Oh, this is so good. This helps us, y'all. Are you, is this making sense to us? Remember he said, this is persecution and affliction that came to me at Antioch. We read that one. At Iconium, well, that's Acts 14, verse two. But the unbelieving Jewish leaders stirred up. They stirred up. The Gentiles, listen, that's spirits. That's demonic spirits. They stirred up the Gentiles, watch this, and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. Did you see that? They stirred up, that's words, words and spirit on words because words are spiritual containers. We know that. And so the words they were saying, but they were influenced by demons, saints. And those words, it was stirring the, the people up. And, and those words and those spirits that were being used and released on those words was stirring up the minds of the people and making the people's minds Evil affected. It was their mind. Are you, is this making sense to us? Remember, he said, "This is persecution and affliction that came to me at Antioch." We read that one. At Iconium, well, that's Acts fourteen, verse two. But the unbelieving Jewish leaders stirred up. They stirred up the Gentiles. Listen, that spirits. That's demonic spirits. They stirred up the Gentiles, watch this, and made their minds evil affected against the brethren. Did you see that? They stirred up, that's words, words and spirit on words because words are spiritual containers. We know that. And so the words they were saying, but they were influenced by demons, saints, and those words, it was stirring the, 
the people up and, and those words and those spirits that were being used and released on those words was stirring up the minds of the people and making the people's minds evil affected. It was, their mind was affected by evil toward the brethren. Isn't it interesting? It never says in your Bible, and their minds were made evil against the lost or against the demon possessed. No, it's always at the light, at love, at joy, at truth, at righteousness, at faith. All right, we're looking at persecutions and afflictions here. All right, watch this. Made their minds evil affected toward the brethren. Verse three, long time therefore abode they speaking boldly in the Lord, which gave testimony unto the word of his grace and granted signs and wonders to be done by their hands. But the multitude of the city was divided and part held with the Jewish leaders and part held with the apostles. There's persecution and affliction. All right, now back to 2 Timothy, same place, verse 11 where we're at. You know the persecutions and afflictions that came to me at Antioch, we saw it. Iconium, we just read it. At Lystra, well, go back, let's stay in Acts 14. And let's look at this verse, please. Let's go to verse 19. And there came there certain Jewish leaders from Antioch. Okay. Now we read, that was just a chapter ago. We know what happened in Antioch. We read it. Remember? The first one we read. They were contradicting, filled with envy, spoke against and blaspheming the things that they were talking about, stirring them up, stirring, contradicting, contradicting. All right. Well, verse 19 there came certain Jewish leaders from Antioch. I mean, they followed Paul all the way from Antioch to Lystra just for this reason, to contradict and blaspheme. Contradict and blaspheme. Stir the people up. Stir the people up. Stir the people up. Have you ever felt like everywhere you go for us, and and it's usually in seasons, everywhere you go, there's somebody there to just stir things. Huh? Come on. Listen, that's spirits. And I'm saying this to remind us, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might, put on the whole armor of God, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood. Stay with me. There came certain Jewish leaders all the way from Antioch, and they also came from Iconium. (laughs) Isn't this something? who persuaded the people and having stoned Paul, they drew him out of the city supposing him to be dead. They they persuaded the people. That's spiritual. They persuaded the people with words, 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 and and spiritual influence on their words. And they came all the way from, from, from... Iconium and came all and into the next town where he's at, and their whole motive is just stir the people up. Stir the, listen, that's that messenger of Satan sent to Buffett, Buffett, Buffett. How's he doing it? By through people that that will listen to it and don't know it's not them. And so they start yielding to that stuff and they, they talk it, they talk it, and, and it stirs up and stirs up. And so eventually Paul gets buffeted. And buffeted, and buffeted, and buffeted. That is demonic spirits. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. 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 We are not wrestling against flesh and blood, but against principalities, power, messengers of Satan. And his grace is more than enough. Now, his grace is not just saying, God, your grace is enough. No, we're going to end in, in a few minutes. We're going to end this with some kingdom tools to access. You have to access grace. Remember that. 
It's not, a, oh, Jesus deliver me. He has. You see this? We have to know things. It's a chess match, if you will. And before you do this, make sure, make sure that you don't expose your queen by acting hasty and moving that pawn out there. Chess is, mm. I got real serious into chess. I never got good at it, but I got real serious at it. I'm going to tell you what, Ethan can play chess and Chris Rowland can throw down at chess. And I started playing with, with them a couple of times, mainly Ethan. And, and God led me to, I told Jody, I said, I really believe the Lord's leading me to start learning the game of chess. And I'll tell you what, and the thing God taught me was in all that, it wasn't even about chess. It was about this. Before you make that move, make sure that you're not going to expose or open a door somewhere else. Because once you do it, it's his move now. And you may, you, 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 you you, you might take his pawn and lose your bishop. Huh? You may think, <laughs> Duh! and you got a little pawn. And then he goes, Rrrr! and you just lost your queen, the most powerful piece on the board. And before you know it, you're in checkmate. In other words, there's nowhere else you can go on this level. I'm out of options here. I'll tell you, it'll make you think before. The Bible says, it says that a fool is hasty with his words. Is this, we do, is this helping anybody tonight? We don't want to give place to the devil. He has enough place already just by people that yield to him. All right, so watch this. We're in Acts 14. There came their Jewish leaders from Antioch and Iconium who persuaded the people and having stoned Paul, they drew him out of the city, supposing him to be dead. Verse 20, however, as the disciples stood round about Paul, he rose up, raised from the dead. And he came back into the city. He went back into the city that they'd just been persuading the people to the point they stoned him till dead. We know God led him to do that because the natural man would not go back into that city. Huh? Unless you went back with, in your default, went back with a bunch of rocks yourself. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> but he didn't do that. It don't say, and Paul got up from the dead and loaded his pockets up with rocks and got 14 uh, magazines full of 45 ACP and went back into the city. It don't say that. It don't say that, does it? And Paul went and gathered all of his friends that knew him as Saul and they all went back into the city. It don't say that. <laughs> And Paul turned on the song, I got friends in low places and went back into the city. It don't say that. Huh? Paul didn't put his headphones and turn on down with the sickness and walk back into the city. He didn't do that. He was in faith, brother, the first time and he was in faith going back into the city. Uh, hope you're getting something out of this. They stood around him. He went back into the city and the next day, imagine what this man looks like physically. They stoned him till dead and the way they would do it, these people knew what they're doing. One stood up on the edge of a kind of a small, it, it was a, and they would put you up against a flat place on the mountainside. They'd put you up against that and they would stone you. It was usually kind of into a corner area and they would all stone you like that. And then one guy standing on top, once you were down, he drops a big rock on top of your head. And listen, they stoned by law, you stoned until death. And that's who these people were that was stoning him. And the next day, imagine what he looks like. That's why later he wrote a church and he said, he said, 
And he said, I, I don't want God to send me down there with a sword. He's talking about the spirit and his words, the, the, the spirit that God sends him to them in. He said, I want to come soft and meek, not with a sword. He said, but listen to me, I bear the marks of an apostle in my body. And this is part of what he was talking about. Five times he, was, he took the Jewish scourging. Three times he was beaten with rods, the Bible says. That was the, that was the tool that it was basically, a, a, if you will, a piece of rebar that the Roman soldiers practiced with so they wouldn't cut each other with their own swords. He was three times beaten with that. He said, he said more than once I was shipwrecked and all night wading out in the water. He said, I've been abandoned by my own countrymen. He said, I've suffered hunger. I've suffered loss. He said, but I count all those things as just dung so that I may obtain the very thing that he obtained me for. Amen. That's huge, y'all. You, you don't start out there, I'll assure you. That takes, you gotta love God, Jack, is what I'm saying. You gotta love God to do that. I'm not talking about, you, you, it's not, Loving your church, loving your position, that won't empower you in that. <laughs> you gotta love God. Some folks get offended because their heart rock shake ain't right and I just wanna slap them in their mouth because, and they wanna come in here and sing and act like you are all victorious. You lose your victory over some of the smallest little P-ant issues Come on, saints. And then you won't talk about victory in Jesus. Oh, really? Really? Oh, really? Thank you, Miss Laura. It is good, isn't it? Mama Laura said it's good. See, if she, she said it's good. That empowers me. See, I can say anything I want to now. Not really. <laughs> Listen, it's not enough to talk it. Bible says, talking about persecution and affliction, it says live a life in front of them that though they run you down and talk smack about you and stir up the people, there's nothing they can prove that, 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 because, because they know your life. All right, stay with me here. We're, 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 we're putting walls up now. We're about to start on the roof. So he's talking about persecutions and afflictions and, and how he endured them. Back to 2 Timothy 3.10. Let's read that verse 10 and 11. Verse 11. Persecutions and afflictions which came unto me at Antioch, came unto me at Iconium, followed me all the way to Lystra. Those persecutions I endured. So this is what I want to say. What do I do with persecution? I endure it. Now Listen. That don't mean I just write it out and whatever happens, happens. No, there's a biblical way to endure it. Endurance is also the word patience. And that word means a calm, steadfast endurance. You can only do that by faith. You, you, can't, you can't do that in the natural man. And watch what happens he said, I endured them. And this was the result of him enduring it and keeping his self right. The Lord delivered me out of them all. You see that? Because he kept himself right. He said, the Lord delivered me out of them all. Over here, he says, the Lord delivered me out of the mouth of the lion. He called that, those settings, the mouth of the lion. This is a, a, a thought worth thinking about. If you won't bow your words, you won't bow your knee. In the setting, you won't bow your knee if you first of all have not bowed your words. If you keep your words and the way you keep your words right is not just by being, okay, I gotta, I gotta say the right thing. I gotta say, no, by keeping my heart full of the right thing 
keeps my mouth full of the right thing. That's why he said above all you guard, he didn't say guard your feelings above all that you guard. Contrary to what a lot of people do, he didn't say that. That's carnal. That's natural. And he said, that's, you're just a normal man or a person. He said, above all you guard, guard your heart because out of the heart flows the forces, plural, more than one, forces of life. Let me tell you something. The Bible says, and I'll give you a scripture if you want. Proverbs 12, 6. Well, no, that's not the one. Uh, Proverbs 12, 18 says, there are people that speak and their words are like the piercings of a sword. Listen, saints, that's spirits. That's spirits. That's spirits. There's words. And then there's words when they are empowered by a spirit. It's different. It is different. We get anything? All right. Let's look, if you will. Let's go with me. Turn to turn to First Kings, way back here at the beginning. After the first five books, you'll you'll get into Joshua Judges, and you keep going to the right, and and then you'll get into the Samuels. And then we'll get into 1 Kings. I want you to see something here. We're talking about the biblical way to endure persecution and affliction and keeping yourself in the love of God. That's what Ephesians 3, 17 or 14 to 19 tells us to be rooted in and grounded in is the love of God. That's always numero uno. <laughs> Nothing else works without that. All right. 1 Kings 19. Watch this. I want us to see something here. I appreciate you being here tonight. I pray you're getting something out of this. I know you are because it's God's word. We're learning. We're learning tonight. There's edification services and there's education services. We're in education right now it's, and it's good. We need preaching and we need teaching. Hold your place there. I just had a scripture come up, I mean, right up in my spirit. Watch this. Let me find it. I know what you're talking about over here. I believe it's in the gospel of, oh, Lord Jesus, help me. You one brought it up in my spirit. Watch this. It's right along with what we're, what we're, what he has us talking about tonight. Ha! Luke 11. Hold your place there in 1 Kings. Luke 11. Watch this. Luke 11. Luke 11. <laughs> huh? <laughs> Luke 11. And you'll see this many times throughout the Gospels. This is just one example. Luke 11, 53. Watch this. He's talking to the Jewish leaders, the scribes, the Pharisees, the Sadducees. Watch this. And as he said these things unto them, the scribes and the Pharisees began to urge him vehemently and to provoke him to speak. <laughs> you see that? That's what devils do. They want to provoke you to speak. And you'll find, yeah, they want to get in your mouth. Yeah, they want you to, they want you to move off of impulse. That's why the Bible calls it beastly or beastly. Listen, animals do not have the power nor authority to resist demons. Listen, 
one of the best examples is when the demon legion left and went into the herd of swine and they all ran vehemently and choked in the sea. Listen to me. You and I, the born again, have the authority and power to resist demonic spirits. And I'm not, I'm talking about words that are released that have spirits on them. Have you ever had somebody say something to you that kept you up night after night after night? Lose sleep over it. First thing that's in your heart when you wake up in the morning. Last thing that's in your heart before you go to bed. Listen to me. That's spirits. That's, there's no human has that kind of grip in your soul. That's spirits. All right. First Kings, I want you to see this. this is a, we've, I don't know that we've ever looked at this. I've never ministered on this, but let's look at this for just a minute here. First Kings 19, Ahab is king and his wife's name is Jezebel. We've heard, most of us have heard a lot throughout our life about a Jezebel spirit and religion. There's one verse when she gets upset and threatens, it says, and she painted her face and made a threat. And so religion has caught this whole thing on. If you wear makeup and you're a woman, you're a Jezebel. Come on, man. This is so much bigger than that. Matter of fact, uh, sir, if you're critical and judging, you're demonic too. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? It's like saying, if you got a tattoo, you're going to hell. Well, what about the rest of the verse? That the rest of all the context in the same chapter says, if you trim the corners of your beard. What about the rest of the verse that says, if you wear any garment that has more than one, one grain in it, cotton polyester, ha, uh-uh. Then if that's the truth, then you better not eat pork either. I'm just saying, if you're going to bring it out, you better know what you're talking about. He says this, chapter 19, verse 1, please stay with me. And Ahab, that's king, told Jezebel, his wife, all that Elijah had done. Elijah has just finished killing about 500 false prophets and mocked them because they wanted to know who the true God was. And he said, he, he told them what to do and it happened and he proved that his God was the right God. And, he, and then he and his men slew 500 false prophets. Well, now listen, now Jezebel found out. Jezebel is nothing more than the king's wife. Now don't exalt her in your mind to something she ain't. She's just his wife. She's just Ahab's wife. That's all she is. Now watch. Ahab, he's a little, if you keep studying this, he is a, I mean, he is a, oh, I want to say it nice. I don't want to offend. I'm not trying to. He, he is a husband and, and he is a big baby Huey, if you will. He's still on the path. Are you with me here? That's the kind of man this guy is. You read his life. He is a big time powder. He pouts. He pouts. Read it. He pouts. And he pouts to, so that, to, to get his way. And he knows the one that helps him get his way because he's too chicken to be the king that he is. His spirit, demonic, spirit-filled wife will make it happen through fear and intimidation and words that carry that spirit on it. So he pouts long enough and don't eat and she moves on his behalf so that she's not out in the open exposed because demons don't want to be exposed. They want to work through somebody that is in authority so they can run the game through the one out front so that they're never exposed. That 
That's why it's good when a leader has a sound counsel around him. I want to say this, and I believe you do, but I ask you to be praying for me. If you're on the huddle, I, assure you, I believe you pray for me, but I'm asking the church, you pray for me. And if it bothers anybody to hear me say that, you need to be the first one to hit your knees and start praying for me. We're told in the Bible to do that. We're told to do it. I do it for you, but I'm, I ask you to hold me up in prayer. Watch this. Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had slain all the prophets with the sword. <laughs> What'd you do today? Oh man, I finally got those studs up on that, that wall. Really, what'd you do today? Oh man, I finally got that welding done today. What'd you do today? I killed 500 false prophets with a sword. What'd you do today? <laughs> Are you with me? That's one day in the, day of, in the, in the life of Elijah. <laughs> then Jezebel, watch this, sent a messenger. Messenger, messenger. You're with me. A messenger. A messenger unto Elijah saying, now watch, Jezebel didn't come to him. She just sent a message to him through a messenger. And this is what she said. So let the gods do to me and more than that, if I don't make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. In other words, she said, let, let, let the gods do to me worse if I don't kill you by tomorrow like you killed our, those prophets. That's all it was said. A messenger came with a report that, let's say, a 130-pound woman sent to him. No man, rugged as a man as Elijah was, much less filled with the spirit and operating in the spirit of the most powerful prophet in the land. Not that man ain't gonna run from a 130 pound woman message. That's demons, saints. Watch this. We're learning something here. She sent that message. Verse three, and when he saw that, I think that's interesting. It doesn't say when he heard that. It says when he saw that, he arose and fled for his life and came to Beersheba, which belonged to Judah, and left his servant there, told his servant, stay here, stay here. I mean, this man's struggling, saints. Elijah the prophet is struggling. You with me? But he himself went a day's journey Fear driven into the wilderness. I want to say this. That spirit will always lead you away from God, not to God. It leads you into a desert. It leads you into a wilderness because it wants to get you isolated. Where it's just you and that voice. You and that threat. You watch National Geographic. Them lines, says the line don't back down from any animal in the, on the planet. And them lines, they, go, they have a plan and they start circling. And if they can get one, of that, one in that assembly to peel off, they leave the, let all the rest of them run. This one's done. Why? They isolated him. You can't run forever. There's one of you and 30 of us. You're a little deer. We're lines. Are you with me? And the Bible says in the last days, let us assemble. Even more as the end days approach, more and more. It's not just so we can preach and teach. And eat. No, it's because something happens when hey, there's safety in us. It's God's plan. Yes, watch this. Stay with me. We're, we're, we want to get this right quick. He was fear driven a day's journey into the wilderness and he came and sat down under a juniper tree and he, 
requested for himself that he might die. Suicidal thoughts come from the spirit of fear, intimidation, and Jezebel. Are you with me? He asked God, God, take my life. Those thoughts come from a Jezebel spirit. I'm not, don't think woman when I say Jezebel. Don't think a makeup woman when I say Jezebel. I'm talking about a spirit of intimidation. I'm talking about the spirit of fear. Threat, terroristic threats the Bible talks about. Words that can be spoken. And I mean, I mean, move your spirit and soul. Keep you up. Ruin your sleep for a few days. Anybody ever had this happen? I have. I've lived that. And there's a right way to handle it and there's a, a, the wrong way which just don't work. Watch this. He asked, he asked that he might take my life. He said, it's enough now, O Lord. Take away my life for I'm not better than my father's. Now you see he's getting more focused on self, more focused on self. If the enemy can get you to focus more and more and more on self, more on self, more on self, I'm out of the love of God now because the love of God is always others focused. And that's where my empowerment is. If it gets me focused on me, 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 how bad it is, oh God, oh God, oh me, me, me. I tell you what, that's table for one. This is so good. It was good when I read it, but boy, when you ministered under the anointing, it gets better and better. <laughs> The anointing is what makes any of this worth anything. The letter kills, but the spirit gives life. <laughs> All right, watch this. Verse five, and as he laid up, slept under the juniper tree, behold, an angel touched him and said unto him, get up, meat. He don't, tie. isn't that good? The angel didn't sit down and say, it's been such a bad day for you. I know, she shouldn't have talked to you like that. You poor thing. He didn't do it. He said, get up. He said, get up and eat. You laying there sucking your spiritual thumb, Mr. Prophet. All of Israel's suffering because of you, boy. You're, you're the prophet of Israel. Get up. Everybody that's under your authority is suffering. Get up. You focused on you. Get up. Well, you don't love me. Yeah, I love you. That's why I'm telling you, get up. And all the church said, amen, please. Get up. And he looked and behold, there was a cake baked on the coals. I'm talking about God sent an angel, cooked him a meal. He said, I've even cooked it for you. Get up. All you got to do is put it in your mouth. <laughs> Watch this. He baked a cake on the coals. A cruise of water was placed at his, at his, in his bolster. And he, and he did eat and drink. And he laid down again. <laughs> Are you, stay with me now. And the angel of the Lord came again the second time, touched him and said, get up, eat. Same message. Get up, meat. The journey is too great for you. And he arose and did eat and drink and he went in the strength of that meal 40 days and 40 nights. I'm talking about when God gives you something. Huh? I mean, bro, that's better than hobbit bread right there. I mean, huh? Remember when they took that bread? That certain kind of, keep, God made him a meal by an angel twice. Let me say it this way. I like, I, I, let's, let's cut it open just for a second here. There's some things to get victory, you gotta, you, you gotta, you gotta eat it more than once. <laughs> huh? You gotta go back and uh, eat it again. And eat it again. And eat it again. And, and you might have to quote it and say it and say it and say it. And you don't knock everybody out. <laughs> Are you with me? <laughs> Huh? You, some things you, you got to be like a cow. You, you swallow it and, and God said, you ain't done with that. You, you chew on it again. 
Come on now. I knew Miss Barbara would like that. And you, you swallow it down and God said, well, you ain't got 10% of the nutrients that's in that truth I just gave you. You spit it back up in your mouth and you chew on it again. It is good. You chew that cub. You get, get every, listen to me. Some of us need to remember some of the things God already taught you. Huh? And you need to regurgitate that thing up and, and chew on it a little. Oh, I just need a word. Are you walking in the revelation that you already have? He that hath to him more will be given. So I just got to make sure I'm a hather. <laughs> Are you here? All right, let's finish this and we'll end this up. We're talking about, I'm talking about spirits here. Watch this. He went in the strength of that one meal for 40 days, 40 nights. And he came there unto a cave and he lodged there. Found him a cave. Behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said, what are you doing here? Isn't this good? It's what it says. What doest thou here? What he said was, what are you doing? And he said, I've been very jealous for the Lord God of hosts for the children of Israel forsaken the covenant. They've thrown down your altars and slain your prophets with the sword and I am the only one left. Don't ever think that you're just, you know. If you left, the whole thing would probably go under without you. I've seen God prove to some people, we'll just show you that it can go on without you. I'll tell you what, you're like, ooh, you moonwalk real slow back off that city. It's like, well, I do so much, nobody appreciates all that I do. Well, let me ask you this, who are you doing it for? Well, the Lord, duh. Really? Then why do we need to all know about it? Why do you need your name in the bulletin every Sunday? <laughs> huh? She didn't put my name in the book. <laughs> yeah, I told her not to, just to help you get past that. <laughs> Are you here? It was so hard for her not to, but I told but don't put that in there, please, Barbara. <laughs> We're growing. Anyway, we'll we'll end with this. If you keep reading, you'll find out. Listen to me, please hear this. I want to end with this. I know we've gone a couple minutes late, but whatever. The, the clock's not our God. I've determined that clock ain't my God. Listen, if you will study the rest of this, you'll find out that Elijah would not confront that spirit of Jezebel. It was extremely intimidating spirit. Saint. It is, it's more than any human can intimidate in natural intimidation. And because he wouldn't, God said this to him. He said, Elijah, Elijah, I want you to go down to this town. And I, he said, you're going to find a young man out there. He said, I want you to anoint him to take your place. And that man's name was Elisha. And he said, also, I want you to, I believe it was Nabu. He said, I want you to anoint this man to take the place of Ahab. Because as a king, he won't stand in his kingly authority against that, that spirit that's on his wife. He said, so you anoint this man to take the king's place because he won't walk in it and you anoint that man to take your place. Ugh. And the Bible says that Elijah went down and he saw a young man that was plowing with two yoke of oxen. And the Bible says he just walked by him and touched him. And it says... Elisha dropped the reins and said, I'll follow you wherever you go. Now listen, God had already apparently been working in that young man's heart too. And he didn't even know why God was working in his heart. But when a divine appointment walked by him and just touched him, he said, first let me just go tell my, my family by. And Elijah said, Elijah said this, do whatever you want. What? I ain't said nothing to you. You imagine what Elijah's having to overcome knowing I'm going to be training you to replace me. Could you do that? 
And it was all because he would not stand spiritually against that Jezebel spirit. And the Bible says this, when they were walking together, that Elijah was taken up in a whirlwind, remember, chariots of fire. And it says that Elijah, the, it says a double portion of that man's anointing came upon him. And listen, what did he do? The Bible says this. He told Elijah, you anoint him to take your place and you anoint that man to take King Ahab's place. And he said this, all the, all the false prophets that didn't get killed with Ahab, this new king will slaughter him. He said, and he said, and Elijah, Elisha will deal with Jezebel. And you study 2 Kings and you'll find out Elisha comes into the town one day and he looks up and Jezebel, I'm not talking about a woman, I'm talking about a woman that was used by a strong spirit. He looked up and he said, cast her off of that roof. And the Bible says the men grabbed her and threw her over the roof and she hit the ground so hard that her bowels gushed out and splattered high up on the walls. And the Bible says that, and he even said, he said, the dogs will eat you. And the Bible says that all that was left was her head, her feet, and her hands. Listen to me. God dealt with that thing. And this is what I want to remind us last of. We've been raised up far above principality, power, might, dominion, all devils, all demon spirits. God's not given us the spirit of fear. That word fear is timidity, cowardice, to shrink back. No, we, by faith we put on the armor of God and we stay in the love of God. And the Lord delivers me out of them all. Did you get anything out of this teaching? He'll deliver you. He'll deliver you out of them all. Father, thank you for your word. We believe it, we receive it by faith and know that if God be for us, who can be against us? Lord, Keep leading us. Keep guiding us. We thank you for our place in Christ. Thank you for the name of Jesus. Thank you for the blood of Jesus. Our faith is in it. We believe in the name and we love one another. Therefore, we believe we are born again of your word and of your spirit. I ask you tonight, Lord God, to bless the seed that is sown when we give our offering and the tithe to you. I ask you to bless it and multiply it back into the lives of the people. In the name of Jesus, amen. God bless you tonight. As you're leaving, you can sow your seed in the backs where they are. Tomorrow morning, men's meeting. It's gonna be great, great, great. We're having a wonderful time. If you're a man and you wanna be here, 6.30 a.m. is when we start. Thank you for being here tonight. I pray you enjoyed yourself. Take what you, you, you learned and, and, and meditate on it. Walk in it. God bless you. Thank you.